Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at NATO headquarters in sunny Brussels, where we have the opportunity to sit down with Patrick Turner, who is the Assistant Secretary General for Operations, uh, a renowned British diplomat who also spent a couple of years in Washington where we got to know each other. Patrick, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much for the chance. Uh, I want to start off with uh, Afghanistan. Um, that's a mission that the Alliance has been engaged in since 2001, since the 9-11 attacks. Um, now the American administration, uh, President Trump, wants to deploy 4,000 more troops uh, to that. There is a new strategy formulation process. Um, that mission has been as an, uh, as an American a mission, as a NATO mission. How are you coordinating with the U.S. review from a NATO standpoint? Um, and are you looking at the possibility of more NATO troops going to support that mission as well? So we, um, we always work together extremely closely with the US. It uh, is a major contributor to the NATO operation. Currently, um, about half of the troops in our mission, uh, so our mission is 13,000 people, half of the troops are US. Um, so we're, as the US review proceeds, we've been coordinating very closely, but we've also been doing our own work as we normally do on force generation, looking forward um, especially to 2018. Um, over the past few weeks, we've had uh, a number of other allies stepping forward with um, additional perspective, additional force contributions. Um, we expect to um, discuss all this at the NATO defense ministers meeting, also with our resolute support partners and um, our commanders and the Afghan uh, Minister of Defense um, on Thursday this week in, in Brussels. So um, we look forward to taking decisions on um, future uh, force levels in the coming weeks. I'm not expecting to do that this week, but in the coming weeks. What does the alliance have to do differently in prosecuting this campaign, where every single time it looks like gains been made and there are reductions in forces, the Taliban comes back, there's a metastasis, you know, you'll see um, you know, ISIS, for example, strengthen its position. What's the key in this next phase of this operation to make sure that there is a more sort of lasting reset? Or is this a mission where everybody has to get comfortable to, that they're going to have to deploy troops to Afghanistan for many more decades to come? So General Nicholson, the um, NATO and U.S. commander in Afghanistan, said earlier this year that um, uh, the current uh, state of play in Afghanistan is an equilibrium which favours um, the government. Uh, if you go back to uh, the end of 2014 when the previous um, combat mission, um, the ISAF mission, ended and uh, at its height that had 140,000 people, I think um, not uh, many people would have been predicting that um, the Afghan security forces would have done as well as they have since um, they took over full security responsibility for Afghanistan in 2015. Um, they've been holding the line, um, they've been developing themselves, they've been developing um, their capabilities, their tactics, their um, equipment, um, but more is still necessary. So um, the more uh, consists of a four-year um, Afghan roadmap, so an Afghan-led devised um, roadmap um, for four years, um, from now uh, to uh, which involves uh, developing their special forces, developing their air forces, developing um, their leadership uh, and so on. And um, we want to be with them in, in, in supporting that. And um, that is their strategy for um, improving, further improving the situation on the ground. Are you satisfied with, with their progress? I think they, as I say, um, if you had gone back to 2014 and um, look at what commentators were saying then about what would happen um, uh, when the bulk of um, uh, US and other nations um, forces in Afghanistan uh, moved out of Afghanistan when the NATO combat mission ended. Um, you know, the, the forecasts then were pretty gloomy. I think um, those forecasts have not been um, proved correct. So I think there's been some good progress, um, but there's more progress to make, and um, we've made clear that we want to um, be with Afghanistan and sustain um, the mission as um, that progress is being made. Well, from an operational sense, the alliance has been re-gearing toward the high-intensity, peer-on-peer uh, um, deterrence and potential, you know, God forbid, potential fight uh, against Russia, for example, post-Crimea in 2014. 
What are some of the lessons that we've learned in Afghanistan from the ISAF deployment that can be applied in your estimation to sort of readying us? You know, even though they're very, very different fights, what are the bits of the stuff that we've learned in the ISAF operation that can be applied to improving the alliance in the event of a higher-end uh, operation? So I would say that you know the alliance has uh, always been here, or certainly been here for a long time, to you know both to um, do its core collective defence mission. That's never um, gone away since the alliance was founded, but. Um, since the 90s also to do um, other um, crisis management uh, missions outside um, NATO uh, territory, uh, you know, speaking uh, as being a, a UK um, civil servant, um, the UK has never lost sight of um, the need to uh, be able to walk and chew gum. Um, I don't know whether we um, transport lessons from one type of mission to another, but it's always been the case that we need to be able to do um, both. Um, there's obviously um, in the last two or three years been uh, an increased re-emphasis on our core collective defence mission um, and being um, ready for any eventuality. Um, we're not uh, neither uh, predicting nor wanting um, a large-scale um, conflict on um, uh, NATO territory, but we need to be ready for um, anything uh, that might be thrown at us. It is a move back to the Alliance's roots, which was the high-intensity uh, A2AD environment to operate in. Uh, you, in fact, started your civil service career, and I, I misspoke a little earlier when I said diplomat, civil service uh, career, in 1984 at what would, could be argued was the peak of the Cold War. Um, is enough being done to get the mindset of the alliance back into that high-end uh, game? It's different than it was during the Cold War, but it has a degree of unpredictability to it this time around that still requires folks to sort of change how they think. Do you see a change in how folks are thinking? So I think there's been, there have been a, a set of serious, um, deliberate, thoughtful, but also rapid moves since 2014 to um, assure allies to um, provide um, the clear ability to exercise deterrence. And if um, deterrence fails, um, defense. Um, I think there has been a, a mindset shift within the alliance. As I said before, the, you know, the, the collective defense mission has always been there. That's, that is the core of um, the purpose of, um, of the alliance. So the mission has never gone away, but there's a re-emphasis on what it, um, what it takes um, to do it. Uh, so uh, we've troubled the size of our rapid reaction forces. We've uh, um, created a very high readiness uh, task force. Um, we're just uh, at the end of deploying um, enhanced forward presence battalions in the Baltic states um, and Poland. Um, the US uh, is uh, also under the European Reassurance Initiative um, deploying uh, more US forces and uh, the ability uh, pre-position of, of equipment to allow uh, the deployment of, of more forces. So this has been a very serious focus for the Alliance in the last several years and it will continue to be for as long as that's needed. Um, in, a, in a Russia context, are you satisfied that the Alliance is ready to deal with any eventuality at this point? So I, I would say um, uh, the Alliance always needs to be ready um, for a range of contingencies. Um, one of the um, things that I think I've learned from um, 32 years in, in and around defense is that uh, futurologists are uh, pretty poor at um, saying what the next challenge is going to be. Right. So. Um, I would hesitate to say um, this or that risk is the main one that we should be worrying about. You need to have um, st policies, structures, forces which are able to cope with a variety of contingencies. But uh, the answer to the specific question is, are, are we um, ready for um, uh, a collective defence um, situation in Europe? The answer is yes. Um, and if the answer were no, um, then NATO would be failing. Uh, when you look at um, our supply lines, it looks, it's a little bit the opposite of what NATO experienced during the Cold War. 
The Russians were the ones with extended su supply lines of communications, and we had relatively short ones. Now the shoe's on the other foot, where our lines of communications are much more stressed, uh, stretched as you particularly get to the Baltics. Um, what are some of the, th are, are you satisfied, and what are the things the Alliance is doing to address that specific challenge. There was the incompatibility of rail lines, for example. Uh, there were border uh, crossing challenges and the like. Are you satisfied with the progress that's being made? And what is the progress that's being made, I should rather ask, in order to be able to address that challenge, which any military planner would seek to try to exploit uh, on the other side? So I think this is a, you know, an area on which we've um, had to focus, again, the ability to um, move um, forces uh, to and through Europe, um, so some logistic challenges, some border crossing challenges. This has been um, a strong area of focus uh, in the last several years. We're seeing um, very good progress. Um, uh, nations have taken a range of steps, including uh, where necessary changing national legislation and changing national procedures to make it um, uh, easier to do this. I think um, there is still further to go um, and we'll be um, taking chances in the coming months and years to, to test um, how much um, f uh, further we still have to go um, using the chances of um, exercises to do um, uh, deployments of units. Um, uh, the US has uh, been uh, doing that with its own its own deployment, so testing you know, our uh, ports and railways and airports actually able to take forces and then move them from country to country um, with the speed that you would need in these circumstances. But as I say, um, we're, not, uh, we're not forecasting these circumstances. We're not um, wanting them. Um, you know, everything that we're doing is um, seeking to avoid finding ourselves in that circumstance, but we need to be ready um, if we ever did. Any, uh, uh, anything any sort of red listed items from your standpoint, anything that, you know, what, what encourages you with what you see with in, in the wake of each of these exercises and where do you think more work is needed? I think the thing uh, that I would take most encouragement from in a more general sense is um, the will uh, and commitment of allies, you know, across the alliance. Um, to make this set of measures that we've taken since 2014 um, work to contribute to um, our high readiness forces, to contribute to the enhanced forward presence forces, um, uh, to uh, move to a more credible um, deterrent uh, posture. Uh, I think, you know, down at the technical um, level, uh, speed of mo moving forces, making sure that um, each uh, each level in a national um, bureaucracy, um, all the different um, officials, different parts of a system which are involved to make sure you can get move forces quickly in and through um, a country. There's probably still more work to do in some places to make sure that the um, the message has actually got through to every level, so that um, on the day uh, either. Um, uh, testing this or in the worst case for real it actually worked on the day. Um, you're one of the alliance's leading nuclear experts uh, and our Russian friends um, continually use the nuclear word uh, both as threat but in part Vladimir Putin's message also is through exercises but also in rhetoric to acculturate his forces to the naturalness of using nuclear weapons in conventional combat operations. Uh, we, we saw the landing, their uh, amphibious uh, mock exercise, uh, you know, against Montenegro involved a tactical nuclear weapon. And increasingly, um, their leadership is talking about the normalcy of doing this. And so if you talk to some folks in Washington, they're saying, you know, in, in that environment, the game fundamentally changes, especially when a country has a vast assortment of tactical nuclear weapons. From your standpoint, is there enough thinking that's been devoted to this from a NATO standpoint? Um, and how does NATO have to change its game against an adversary that is, is looking at a very different way of potentially prosecuting a campaign than that it will not be purely conventional uh, and the intention 
I'm told by folks who look very closely at Russian doctrine is, we will keep any detonation well below the line of anything that should trigger a strategic nuclear exchange, which is sort of a, an interesting gray space to try to take advantage of. But it's a little Crimea-like, right? It's, it, it's exploiting a gray space. You know, tell us a little bit about how you're wrapping your mind around that very, very complicated, very difficult problem. So I think uh, people have been uh, thinking and looking hard at the question of how to um, how to deter. Um, that's not not new. We've looked at the question of how to deter um, for decades, actually. But um, there's a there's a new environment. I don't think the alliance um, wants to engage in, um, if you like, uh, reciprocal strategies. So um, it needs to understand um, a Russia which. Um, integrates the potential, the threat or potential use of nuclear weapons um, into um, its military uh, doctrine, into its defence doctrine in a way that um, individual allies and NATO do not. So um, we need to be able to cope with that. I think there's a clear-eyed recognition that that's the case, but that doesn't mean that um, we're going to move our doctrine um, to match. It does need mean that we need to be... Um, um, ready uh, to deal with that threat. Um, it's part of uh, the reason for um, assuring allies for a strengthened deterrence um, posture that um, we uh, know, allies will know that they have um, a uh, firm deterrence in place against um, that kind of um, threat. Uh, but I think we need to, um, as part of our deterrent posture, we need to maintain an evidently credible um, uh, nuclear deterrent uh, capability we need to remain and um, it's been clearly stated um, for example at the Warsaw summit that we will remain um, a nuclear um, alliance um, the alliance continues to contain um, uh, three recognized uh, nuclear powers um, all with uh, their own clear um, deterrence uh, postures so it, it's it, it's part of um, it's part of our thinking, but we're not going to match um, Russian thinking where um, it remains um, uh, and will remain a last resort. Um, you know, we do not want to see in any circumstance a, a use of nuclear weapons. Do you think that a de declaratory policy would be helpful, that the alliance makes clear that there's no such thing as the detonation of a small nuclear weapon as long as it has the, the N-word attached to it? It's something that is that could elicit a wider response by way of deterrence. Um, I, as a as a somebody who has been involved in UK nuclear policy, I, um, I I'm I think the distinction between a small, a medium, a large use, a sub strategic use, a strategic use is a um, is a distinction with a limited meaning at at, at best. Um, a use of a nuclear weapon um, is highly strategic. Um, so uh, a doctrine may say that it it's not strategic, um, but it, it always is strategic. It's you know the, uh, it would have um, enormous consequences. So enormous doesn't mean uh, you know uh, enormous use of nuclear weapons, but. It, could never be anything um, but strategic. Um, and I think we need to be um, very clear with ourselves, um, but also with others about that. Patrick Turner, Assistant Secretary General for Operations. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks for the time.